Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, He is my fortress, He is my rock. He is the one in Him I trust. Let's pray together. Father, you are our refuge, you are our shelter, you are our rock, our fortress, the God in whom we trust, and that strengthens us as we live each day. We confess we forget it too frequently. Would you remind us of it now that in these moments as we gather before you, we will be strengthened and equipped We'll draw near to you now to be prepared to walk with you this coming week. And so we thank you for that, and we give you all the glory for the work you've done for us and all that you do in us and through us. In the matchless name and power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Welcome to Wyndham Center Church Online. Thank you for joining us on Facebook or YouTube or our website, windhamcenterchurch.com slash, slash listen. We're so thankful to uh, bring the word of the Lord to you each time that we're together and trust that it's an encouragement. That is really the most important thing to us over these times online is that uh, you come to know the Lord better, you come to rely on the Lord more strongly, and you go forth to serve him more fully and with more love uh, as Jesus grows in your life. If, uh, if we can know that that's happening for you through what God is enabling us to do, that's really what it's all about. If there are things that are a particular blessing or an encouragement to you, would you let us know? Uh, shoot off an email or a message or use the old-fashioned means of the post office and, and just send off a message. We'd love to hear how God has been working in your life and strengthening you and if we've had the privilege to be a part of that. Well, we're almost ready to go back to our fall schedule. I know that doesn't really impact all of you online unless you're getting ready to come back and join us. Uh, the 10 o'clock hour continues for today and for uh, Labor Day weekend in person. Uh, but following that, our in-person returns to 1030, the same time our online uh, ministry will continue. Uh, but so maybe the fall is the time that now you are finally ready to uh, come back and join your church family in person. Uh, while we're so glad for this opportunity, nothing replaces eye contact. Nothing replaces face-to-face, life-to-life, voice-to-voice, arm around a shoulder, friendship, talking together. Uh, you just can't get that while you are on screen. So I just encourage you afresh, uh, come, whether he, maybe even Labor Day weekend next Sunday, but uh, come and worship the Lord together uh, as we return to our 1030 schedule on September 11th. We'll still be at 10 o'clock in person the next two weeks. Our August mission continues to be the Salvation Army. Uh, they have so many different things that they do to seek to bless our community in tangible ways. And we're very thankful to be able to partner with them. Their leader, I don't remember her rank, but Carmen Colon uh, is a woman who loves the Lord and really wants to bless the people in our community. So I want to thank you ahead of time uh, for your participation. If over the course of the summer you picked up a baby bottle from Caring Families, we're getting ready to return them. I still have one or two that are empty and I can have it set aside for you if you'd like to participate. But this is the time where uh, we fill bottles with cash. Some people put a check. Some, excuse me, people will actually go online and, and give that way. But it is the summer long uh, fundraiser for caring families and we're getting ready to return bottles. If you still have one at home, finish filling it up and get it in. If you need somebody to come by to pick it up, we'll be happy to do that as well. Just let us know and we'll, we'll be able to do that. The scriptures this morning, uh, the first passage I'm going to read is from Isaiah chapter 45, uh, beginning with verse 18. <clears throat> This is what the Lord says, he who created the heavens, he is God. He who fashioned and made the earth, he founded it. 
He did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. He says, I am the Lord. There is no other. I have not spoken in secret from somewhere in a land of darkness. I have not said to Jacob's descendants, seek me in vain. No, I, the Lord, speak the truth and I declare what is right. Gather together and come, assemble, you fugitives from the nations. Ignorant are those who carry about idols of wood. They pray to gods that cannot save. And so declare what is to be. Present it. Let them take counsel together. Who foretold this long ago? Who declared the present from the distant past? Was it not I? There is no God apart from me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none but me. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God, there is no other. By myself I have sworn, and my mouth has uttered in all integrity a word that will not be revoked, that before me every knee will bow, by me every tongue will swear. And they will say of me, in the Lord and Yahweh alone are deliverance and strength. All who have raged against him will come and be put to shame. But God's people will find deliverance in the Lord and make their boast in him. All basing on this Old Testament promise speaks of our New Testament Lord in Philippians chapter 2. In your relationships with one another have the same mind that Jesus had who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. God's holy word. Let's pray together. Father, we live in a world that rages out of control. The environment this summer has uh, felt like it's been raging out of control more than many of us remember in different seasons. Whether it continues to be the, the plague that will never end, or perhaps it's the drought, perhaps other things that are taking place. Lord, it's there, and it, we have no power to control it. The politics of our land are out of control. The, uh, the attitudes of violence seem out of control. The, the worries of war and violence around the world and the oppression of people seem to go on out of control. But over all of these things, Lord, you declare that you are the Lord. You are God. There is no one else. There is no one else to turn to. You are the one who is the ruler. And, and certainly you watch as we make of this world what we would. And I think that you watch and wait until we get tired enough of what we're doing and realize that there's no hope in what we're doing so that we call out to you. You invite us, turn to me and be saved. Turn to me for your deliverance. Turn to me for relief. Turn to me for your salvation. But Lord, we are so slow to do that. It is our last resort and, and some are never, ever willing. Lord, we turn to you today. We thank you, Lord Jesus. You have shown how worthy you are for us to turn to you. You you showed us in the power of your life sacrificed for us. You show us not just in the example of sacrifice, but in the payment of the debt for our sins so that we can be washed and cleansed and, and set free and recreated 
for our new and heavenly life. And Lord, we, we want to thank you for that today. We confess you are Lord. We bow our hearts and our lives before you. And we want to live for you. We thank you for that today. Lord, we know many in our relationships with people who aren't interested at all. Some have hearts that are, are very opposed to you. Some just seem ignorant or apathetic. But their need is, is no less great. And so we just want to pray for people in our lives that we want to come to know Jesus. And we ask that you would help us be your messengers. Help us to be people who can speak of you as we show them your love. Lord, perhaps someone has some names of individuals in their own hearts and their minds that they've been praying for. We just want to stop right now and in the quietness of these moments, name names of people that we want to come to know you. So hear us in the quietness of our hearts as we name some of those names, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, there's a, a song that we sing sometimes. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He see, sees each tears that each tear that falls and how, hears me when I call. And Lord, some of these folks, they don't know that. But you would you help us to be a messenger that helps them come to know who you are and to trust you with all of their lives, all of their heart. We thank you for your work in our midst. We think of those whom we love who are still dealing with COVID, cancer, um, relational conflict, economic strife, all of the things that weigh so heavily in their hearts and lives. We lift them up to you, and would you work in our lives a grace that ministers to them and serves them. We ask all of these things in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. Amen. One of the passages that we have been including over these last weeks is uh, Matthew chapter 28. It is commonly called the Great Commission. It is Jesus' words to his disciples, the very last things that he says in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew isn't the only place with such a charge. Each of the Gospels has a charge, and actually so does the first chapter of the book of Acts. And each one of them expresses it in a slightly different form. But Matthew's is the one that people have really named the Great Commission. It takes place when the disciples were in Galilee, where Jesus had told them to go. Uh, they saw him when he appeared to them, and, and some were still a little uncertain about what was going on. But Jesus stood before them, and he said from Matthew 28, beginning with verse 18, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you even to the end of the age. We've been considering uh, these last weeks what some people call the irreducible core. Just the basic essence of the Christian faith and the, the Christian life. You can add a lot to it and, and have a Christian faith, but if you take any of these pieces away, you really don't have authentic Christianity. You, you don't have the kind of Christian faith or life that Jesus really seeks for us to have. If you had a, an atom of hydrogen or an atom of oxygen, you would have the irreducible core of those elements. You can't take away any of the ingredients of an atom and have it, have it be the element. The atom is the smallest unit that is, in fact, the element that it represents. Or if you put the atoms together, the hydrogen and the oxygen, you get a molecule, which is the, the smallest a particle of the compound that you and I know as water. You can't have water without hydrogen and oxygen. This is the smallest thing. Now, 
These are naturally occurring substances in creation. The irreducible core that we're speaking of in terms of the Christian faith is not naturally occurring. It is not something that happens without the active involvement of the people that it concerns. Now, it is there as, as God's eternal will. I mean, that, that's the core of his own heart and his principles of life. But unless it's my conviction and unless it's your conviction, unless it is our conviction and our purpose together, it's never going to actually happen. And it, we can do a lot of things, but if we aren't doing those things, it has nothing to do with being Christian in this world. There are two key passages, and we have focused on them for the last few weeks. The first was in Matthew chapter 22, where Jesus teaches the, the two great commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then here, and your neighbor as yourself, and then here, um, the great commission. And in a way, the great commission is sort of a bracket around that, the commands. It, it begins with Jesus in conversation with his disciples, and it talks with them about what he wants them to do, and then it comes back to the nature of their mission. I guess I would summarize it this way, that the risen Christ asserts his authority over all heaven and all earth, everything in general and everything in specific. As the Lord of all, as Paul described him in Philippians chapter 2, as Lord of all, as commander, as shepherd, as king, what is his very first proclamation to his disciples? Well, I find it interesting, you know, what it is not. It is not this. Now that I've got you together, we are going to go back to Jerusalem and take it by storm and pay back those who killed me. Yeah, no, it's not that. It, it's rather this. I am your Lord. Now go into all the world. And I want, just as I made disciples of you, I want you to go and make disciples for me, for me, of me, everywhere. To all peoples, to all nations, to all tribes, to all tongues. And as you make disciples of me, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them instruct them. Everything that I've taught you, everything that I have told you, everything that I have commanded you, I want you to teach them as well. And as you go and you do those things, I'm with you. I'm with you as far as you go to the ends of the earth. I am with you for as long as you go to the very end of this age. And in this, Jesus creates a, a spiritual life cycle, if you will. It is Jesus speaking to his disciples, whom he has made, whom he has raised up, whom he has taught. And as their teacher and Lord, he says, now I'm commissioning you to do for and to others what I have done to you. I want you to bring my name. I want you to bring my message of salvation to the world so that other people will turn to me just as you have. And I want you to baptize them, which is the initiation into this whole process. I want you to teach them how to live in me and then to go forth for me as well. And just to keep that circle turning over and over and over until I come back. The third aspect of this irreducible core that we're just going to begin to talk about today is that his commission to you and me is that we would be disciples who make disciples. We would be disciples who, following Jesus' will and instructions for our life, make disciples of other people. We, we live before others to show them what a disciple of Christ looks like. We teach them what a disciple does, and we invite them to come and follow. That's really the sum of what this core is all about, the sum of our Christian living, that you and I would love the Lord our God, that you and I would love our neighbor as ourselves, that you and I, as we go off into the world, will spread Jesus' name, will spread his message so that other people will join us as we go along on this journey. Be a disciple who makes a disciple. It really, if you wanted to sum up the whole message of the Christian life, be a disciple who makes a disciple. Now, when you hear the word disciple, I'm wondering what you picture. I can't see your hands if you would raise them, but I guess I wonder how many I would see 
if uh, you thought of pictures from, you know, like the Chosen, where the disciples are there in their first century robes and sandals and beards and uh, walking along the wilderness and the dusty roads following Jesus, I think oftentimes when we think about the disciples, we think about that kind of picture. The New Bible Dictionary uh, tells us that the word disciple is very, very simple, basic word. It just means pupil. It means a learner. It means a student. What that looked like in Jesus' day is that there were rabbis, teachers of the law, teachers of God's word and his faith that would walk around. And the, they didn't have universities and colleges and seminaries, but they had small groups. And so the rabbi would mass around himself a group of, of people, of devoted followers that would be his disciples. A uh, contemporary image might be a mentor with followers. And some people say mentees, mentors and mentees. But people would, they might find a rabbi that they particularly admired and they would want to be joined to his group and somehow be able to do that. Well, well Jesus picked his 12. He picked 12 men that he had to be with him and to teach them, to, to help them know what he wanted them to do. So the, the disciples would follow the rabbi, they would live with the rabbi, they would drink with the rabbi, they would serve with the rabbi, they would learn from him, they would obey him, they would spread his teaching and, and seek to gain more followers for this particular rabbi. As Jesus applies it to us as disciples, being a disciple is nothing less nothing more than the normal Christian life. Every Christian is, by definition, a disciple. If you are not a disciple of Christ, you're not really a Christian because the disciple is the one who has this relationship with Jesus that he or she is living out. And so the disciple is the one who believes Jesus and who has come to believe in Jesus. A disciple is one who has committed to follow Jesus daily. That, that is to learn what he teaches us and seek to do that, to grow an active relationship. And so it, it is, we, we set aside our lives for him because of a person. And Jesus is the core of what it means to be a disciple. Now, you might ask the question, well, so why Jesus? What's so different about Jesus from all of the other disciples? You know, of all of the people who were walking around in first century Judea, why should have people then follow Jesus? Of all of the leaders, all of the celebrity wannabes, all of the, the shapers of people today, why should we follow Jesus? Well, as Christians, sometimes maybe we forget the significance of why we follow Jesus. I think it's very important for us to remember why you and I have picked this simple Nazarene carpenter who lived 2,000 years ago, uh, who wandered the, the byways and pathways of, of Judea and Galilee and Samaria. Why would we follow him? Well, as we read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we look at the life that he lived. We consider the words that he spoke. We watch the signs that he performed for other people. We, we grieve at the death on the cross that he died. We, we are awed by the resurrection that he attained. And we, we know and we realize the truth that he claims about himself that we began with. I am Lord. And I guess we might ask the question, who else? Who, who other than him would you choose? If you're a follower of Christ and you're participating with us today, who, who would you choose? Who else would you pick? It's one of the things that I think is foundational to you and me as a believer is to continue to grow in our grasp of who Jesus is. We will never exhaust knowing him. In fact, if, if we aren't continuing to grow, if he isn't continuing to grow in our own sight, you know, we're stalled. There's something the matter with our walk. In the Chronicles of Narnia, which is a series of books with some children who are learning to follow the Christ figure, and his name is Aslan the Lion, Lucy says in one of the later stories, 
Aslan, you're bigger. Because she's known him from when she first met him in the very first book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And a couple stories on, she sees him and she says, he looks bigger. And, and he says, dear one, I'm not bigger. You're just getting to know me better. You're getting to see me more clearly. And that becomes the image for us in our Christian life, that we continue to grow more and more in awe, in our humble adoration, in, in our worship and our understanding of the Lord Jesus. I read earlier from Psalm, uh, from Isaiah 45 as, as part of why Jesus and no other. This is Yahweh speaking about himself to an idolatrous people. He's speaking to Israel. Israel has pretty much rejected him and they're following idols of their own making. They're, they're, they're worshiping the very same things that people in the nations all around them worship. It wouldn't be very different from today. People worship everything besides God. And God declares in the midst of it, I am God. Yahweh says, I am God. There is no other God. No other God is real. I am the only one. But then going on to say that, it's not a message of judgment right away, but I am God, there is no other. If you want salvation, turn to me. There's nothing else, there's no one else that can deliver you. Turn to me. The day will come when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that I am the Lord. The implication is that some will do that by force and choice at the end because they have no alternative, but they cannot have the benefit. And so his invitation is to turn now while we are still able. It is that passage where God says, I will share my glory with no other. There is no other God. And Paul uses that passage to specifically talk about who Jesus is. We read it from Philippians chapter 2, where the Lord says that he has made him Lord. God has exalted him to the highest place and given him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I think that you understand this. If you have been with us any time at all, you recognize that Jesus is Yahweh. Jesus is the, the personal, real embodiment of everything that Yahweh showed himself to be in the Old Testament. He all took on flesh and became a person and lived with us as one of us. Well, what happened in between Isaiah, where God says there is no other, and Philippians, where God says it's Jesus? What happened? Well, it's what we talked about before, the life Jesus lived and the words that he spoke, the signs he performed, the death he died, the resurrection he attained, and the exaltation that the Father gave to him. He's not sharing his glory with some other God, but it is his Son, who he and the Spirit, the triune God together. And so when Jesus commissions us in Matthew 28, it's basically, I am the Lord. There is no other. I alone have the authority and the power to give to people in this human race what they need to have life after this death. They're all going to die, and I have what they need so that they can be ready for what is to come. And what is maybe the most awe-filling reality is that as he looks at the human race who killed him, it is with compassion. He's filled with compassion. He's filled with forgiveness. He's filled with grace because he would like us to turn to him to receive freedom. He would like us to turn to him to, to receive release from the guilt and the penalty of sin and the delivery into life. You know that. Maybe you're with us today and you really don't know that by experience yet. Well, I invite you today to turn to Christ whom we are talking about because there is salvation in no one else. That is not a narrow-minded, hateful uh, truth, although some people view it that way. It's only narrow-minded and arrogant and hateful if it's, if it's not true. If it's true, it's the message that we need. And, and the message based on Jesus' command here is that you, 2,000 years later, 
can still receive this gift. People all around the world can receive this gift to turn to Christ, to turn away from ourselves, to confess that he is in fact Lord and I am not Lord, to lay down my crown, place it at his feet, to trust him to deliver me. One of the most powerful things about that is that if you read in the book of Acts, he offered that to those who killed him. He offered that to those who crucified him. There's really, in that whole story, there's really only one unforgivable person, and that's Judas, who took his own life out of the guilt of, of leading Jesus off to be crucified, but he didn't hang around in order to have the opportunity of forgiveness. Even the high priest, even all of those who crucified Jesus, Peter and James and John shared the message that they could turn to him and be forgiven. That's why we think of Jesus. But there's, a, there's a second word that I want to focus on this morning, and that is not just why Jesus, but as, as he just says, why Jesus? Well, why, why baptism? What, what does that have to do with? with this. It's because baptism is an outer expression of the response of faith that our first question is calling us to. We believe in Christ, and, and Jesus says he wants the disciples to baptize those who believe in him. Why baptism? Well, many cultures and religions have practiced sacred washing rituals and rites. We certainly know that from Judaism, but, but other religions as well have that. Now, this is not a bath to cleanse the body. Baths to cleanse the body are nice. Um, you know, after, after a long, hot day, or maybe you go to a spa and you get into a nice, warm, sudsy bath and you're just lying back there. And as you're, you're, you're relaxing and your body is relaxing and you feel all the cares of the world just melting away and just feel so cleansing, not just of your body, but of your life. The only problem is when you get out of the water, your body's cleansed, but all those other cares, they come right back onto you. You can't get rid of them like that. The, the act of baptism, however, focuses more on the actual removal of those cares of the baggage that we carry, of the wrongs that we've done, of the dirt of life. And so it's a spiritual thing. People call it a ritual, but that doesn't mean it's nothing. It, it, it contains a spiritual reality where through the act of a washing, we receive the gift of a sense of cleansing. And so there's an outer sign of an inner reality. That's sort of at the core of what the Jews did when they came to John the Baptist. They came for a washing of their lives, uh, of forgiveness, if you will, because they were turning from sin. They were coming to John, and, and the washing represented repentance. It represented a cleansing and being set free. Did anything literally happen to their bodies? No. They were the same people when they came out of the water, but it, it was that symbol. So what a fitting picture is this then for us as Christians? Because it is not a washing of the body, and it's not just a, just a symbol for like mentally feeling better. It represents a true spiritual reality, something that is absolutely true. So that as Jesus gave us communion and the bread and the wine, and that as we eat, we are remembered that through our faith, we were joined to Christ on the cross. Our death was with him. It was the punishment for our sin, that the sacrificial aspect of Jesus' life we have experienced. And we declare that in communion. And we do that all the time, every month when we, when we come together. He gives us the water of baptism to remind us of the new life. And that, that's a once and beginning thing because that new life has a beginning. Um, and so it, baptism is becomes we bringing all of our sin and we have believed in Christ and he has cleansed us. And now he gives us a physical act by which we can experience the reality. And so baptism becomes the time where we pass from the old life to the new life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed, behold, the new has come. 
The old is before the waters of baptism and the new is on the other side. Now, that's not literally in the scripture, but that's the picture. The baptism gives us a very visible picture of that spiritual reality. It's the visible declaration that I have turned my life from myself over to the Lord who I am worshiping. It is Jesus who is the Lord of my life. I am dead to the old ways and now I am alive to him. And so baptism is a fitting picture of this transition. And it, it is what Jesus desires for his followers. Now, as we practice baptism in our church, and I, I'm sort of focusing on this today because on this day, as I'm, I'm preparing, this Sunday, we're actually baptizing a few people over at the campground again. Uh, it's an opportunity where a few individuals are going to declare their public commitment to Christ and, and following him in baptism. And so the, the way that we practice it is it's called believer's baptism by immersion. Uh, there is some latitude in what's available for us and, and how we do it. So it's not law, but that's how we practice it. And, and, and the practice of immersion uh, reminds us of the truths of, of Romans 6, where we are buried with Christ in baptism. The picture of going down into the water of baptism is the picture of death and burial. The old me has died. Then we are raised in Christ to new life and we come out of the water, cleansed, alive, renewed. And, and, and for many people who have experienced going through that baptism, it, it is very life changing to them. Not because the water actually does anything, but because it affirms in their heart, yes, I have now walked through a door. The old is gone. The new is here and I'm here and baptism is a very unique means of being able to do that. It doesn't hurt that the water really symbolizes cleansing and washing and people often feel a great release from their guilt and their sin in, in a very tangible and palpable way. Back in the early church, uh, people would be given white robes to wear. Uh, they would be exchanged their old clothes for white robes symbolizing purity. And so they would go on to live a new life. In 1 Corinthians, Scripture uses words of baptism as Israel leaves Egypt and goes into the journey for the promised land. Uh, when they go through the Red Sea, they are baptized into Moses. It is a picture, even though they didn't get wet, that they use that as a baptism because they're walking through the sides of the water. They are baptized. They have left the slavery and the condemnation of Egypt. They are now under their new shepherd, Moses, and he's going to take them to the promised land. And that is, is a foretelling of what you and I have in Christ. We are baptized. We've left the slavery of sin into our freedom and our new life in Christ. That's why baptism. And for that reason, for many churches, the baptism service is one of the high points of their year. Not because they're counting numbers or anything like that, not because it's some fancy ritual, but because it's a time when people publicly declare they have turned from their old life, they are now living for Christ, and it is a celebration of life in Christ. Confessing Christ out loud, declaring for people to see, and sometimes that is the act that breaks your relationships with people. When you become a Christian and you are baptized, that is the no turning back point. And sometimes family members, sometimes others won't stand for it because that is the act that they understand as your public declaration, much more so than just saying, I've become a Christian. Saying you become a Christian is one thing, but when you actually go through the act of baptism, for some people, it's like, well, that's too much. I just, I can't stomach that. So baptism is the thing that expresses publicly, once and for all, the personal choice to follow this Jesus for whom we asked, why Jesus? So following him now after baptism becomes the, the deal with my final question, and that is, well, why the commands? You know, why Jesus? Why baptism? And why these commands? 
Because if I have been baptized into Christ and I am now walking in newness in life, what do I do? Well, this is both the simplest and the hardest. I mean, it's, it's two things, love God and love other people. Everything is summed up in that. If you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you love other people as yourself, you will never sin. Simple as that. <laughs> and as hard as that. God's new covenant, his, his new relationship with us, is not a pen and ink relationship. It's not a quill and papyrus relationship. It, it is not a pixel and screen relationship. His new relationship with us is a relationship in the heart, where the Holy Spirit, who wrote God's word, and we've had the privilege of reading it, the Holy Spirit brings that word into our very heart. It writes God's law on our heart. Jeremiah 31, taken over in Hebrews uh, chapter 9, the, the law, God's word, is written in our hearts. So in our heart, we want to do what God wants. We want to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We want to love our neighbors as ourselves. We want to do that. And now, through his spirit, we have the power. We have the ability to choose. And he is really doing that work in our heart. And what Jesus is growing in us is then his character. We become like Christ. We become like our Lord. That's the, the commands. That's what Jesus modeled for us, loving the Lord with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, loving neighbors as himself. And so you and I, as we love, our hearts are being transformed and we are being changed. And we have an increased motive then as we look at others who are living the kind of life that we used to live. Boy, we don't want them to do that anymore. We, we know how, how to serve them. We know what to tell them. And so we start praying for friends and family members and others because we want to know how to speak to them. We want to know how to bring out. So our hearts are starting to think about how we can make disciples. How can we converse? How can we talk with them? How can we serve? How can we maybe do build ministry actions? How can, what kind of events can we create to invite people to? What operations can we organize? What things can we do that will communicate to others? And, and the cycle continues. Do you see the cycle continuing? So that in our heart and with our lives, we want to use as many means possible to reach as many people possible, to fulfill Jesus' desire to have people come from all nations. Now, that's not countries. Nation is the word ethne or ethnic group. All people groups, all tribes, all tongues, because Jesus wants at the end of this age, when this world is all done and we're with him for eternity, he wants people from every tribe and tongue gathered around his throne to worship. And I imagine it's going to be amazing when we're all there and we're singing and the sound of like a mighty rushing river filling our ears and filling our soul as millions upon millions of people are singing before the Lord, he is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. My question to you in light of the irreducible core is who do you want with you? Who do you have with you now? Who are people in your life that you know you're going to be shoulder to shoulder right there? Who is in your relationships now that you, you don't know? You are not certain if they are going to be there with you or not. Maybe one of the reasons that you're still here is because this is part of your being a disciple who makes a disciple. It's your responsibility to learn how to speak. It's your responsibility to learn what to say. It's your responsibility to offer and to call because just as someone spoke it to you, don't you think it's through you that the Lord would speak to others? That's the core. 
to be disciples, who want to make disciples, who learn to follow Christ so that they in turn make disciples. And that's what keeps that's what keeps the core. That's what keeps the church growing until Jesus comes back. That's the core. You know, as, uh, to sum it all up, I don't think that it would be too far afield if we understood this as what Jesus really had in his central thought when he had that little conversation with Peter in Matthew chapter 16. Who do people say I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter made this astounding confession. You are the Messiah. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. He said more than he knew and more than he understood. But the, the implications, if Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, my life is lived for him. And it's that faith that I declare at baptism. It's that faith then that, that I live, learning how to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, learning how to love my neighbor as myself, and being able to, to help other people come to know all of that and share that. Isn't that really the core, the rock of our faith? It's the rock that Jesus builds his church on. The confession of faith in Christ that calls people to believe in Christ, that calls us to serve Christ, that calls us to share Christ. The irreducible core. We're going to talk in future times a little bit more about how to make that practical, how to, how to grow and intentionally be growing disciples uh, who have an impact on others. We're going to come back uh, after Labor Day for a couple of weeks to think about that. But in the meantime, I hope that it is your desire and I exhort you to make it your desire to grow in your awe and worship of him who said all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. If you have been baptized, remember that door that you passed through. Remember it again. Israel's problem was that they kept forgetting that they went through that, that water and that God had done that. As Christians, it's easy for us to forget too. Remember what Jesus did for you and remember your commitment to him and renew that. And renew that with an eye to helping other people come to know Christ just as you have because you're still his tools. Let's pray. Lord, what a privilege it is to have come to know you, who you are, and to love you and to worship you and to serve you and to come to the cross and know that we're forgiven and cleansed. Lord, it's so easy to forget that it isn't just for our benefit that you did this for the benefit of others around us who need to know you. And so would you work in such a, in our way that our hearts are filled with the compassion that your heart is filled with? Our hearts are filled with the longing that your heart is filled with so that we would make disciples of all nations, that we would begin with the people whom we know and we had commit to serve you and reach out to them in this way. Lord, strengthen us to do so. For your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us today. We're thankful to think of the great adventure that the Lord has for us. It's certainly a challenge. It is not easy. It is costly in life. It is time consuming. It wants every part of you and me. And the rewards are nothing less than eternal and infinite. If you haven't already, I hope that you'll listen to the music that we have on our playlist on YouTube. Uh, the songs just really are designed to help us see how great, how holy, how wonderful the Lord is. Um, he's worth sharing with other people. So I hope that you'll go and do that. And if you'd like some help and strengthening and being able to do that, well, that's part of what it means to be a pastor. Um, I want to talk with you. Maybe we can put some paths together to uh, help you move in that direction. God bless you in Jesus' name. Bye.